and I, I'm, I'm sure, uh, if you're like me, you remember the good old days. If you're younger, maybe you just read about them. But here's the man who has done all these things, all these accomplishments, winning Le Mans, uh, running those sports prototype cars, the, uh, the Ferraris at Sebring and Watkins Glen, and uh, winning the uh, endurance championships, and then going on to uh, Paris Descartes and running there for several years and winning as well. So that's a lot to talk about, a huge career. And uh, it so happens that if you want to talk races and <laughs> what happened when and what happened the weekend at Watkins Glen, it's all in this book here, recently published. Uh, it's seven pounds and 600 and some pages. <laughs> it is. But it's all in here. And so uh, talking, talking, to Jackie the other, talking, talking to Jackie the other night, uh, he said, well, I don't really want to talk about the races necessarily, but the people and the memories. And uh, I look back at the kind of what they thought about safety at the time as things slowly evolved. And then uh, Jackie was involved, of course, with Stan 21 and Eve fairly early on. Talk a little bit about that, but mainly the people. And so we have, we'll let you be here and I will grab one of these. And uh, as I show things, we'll just casually talk about what you see there and how you remember things. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, of course, good morning, everyone. Um, I so strongly believe we are member of, members of the same uh, company in a way. And I'm tempted to say, uh, my friend, because we have in common clearly the passion for motor racing. And um, you represent probably all the aspect of motor racing. And there is a lot to talk uh, about it. So um, clearly, clearly, Eve's. It's part of the, those pioneers who started to talk about safety and who was involved in the um, huge progress of safety during these, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I would say, um, <laughs> uh, 60 something years. Uh, it's a lot, it's really a lot. What you have to know, and probably some of you know, because there are different type of generation uh, here today, um, safety was not existing in motor racing in the early days. We started from uh, scratch. Uh, the best thing I can remember in those days, as far as the safety was concerned, was um, straw bolts. That's all. Clearly, that's all because we were not even using a, a circuit. We were using the roads to build up a circuit and to organize a circuit and the fans around. So, um, can I say we were in? A, we were not clearly in the Stone Age, but um, not far away. Let's say the Polish Stone uh, Age. <laughs> So, um, Let's... ah, yes, Talk, I did. Talking uh, about uh, the just, beginning, just, just uh... give me one second. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's tempting. It's tempting to believe you are doing something exceptional or whatever, or if they call you a legend or an iconic driver. Or... I think that's not the point. The point is to tell you that racing drivers, and in many aspects in life, other lives as well, they are in a way the top of the iceberg. They pick up the light, they pick up the glory, they, <laughs> they are kind of thieves in a way. Because underneath the level of the top of the iceberg, you see, 
there is a large group of people. And you know what is an iceberg? That much on top, it's very impressive what you have underneath. It's impressive because the, peop the people who are there who share the same passion as us, you never see them. But they have the motivation, they have the love for motor racing, and they prepare the tool to help you to win or to lose a race. But without them, nothing exists. And that has to be said. 90% of the job is done in the shadow. And also when you are successful for these people, the satisfaction is to have done the right job. And for those who haven't not did uh, correctly or who are reaching almost the top, is to make another extra effort behind to... Uh, so when you come here to, to, to hear me or to hear um, Yves and his, because he is an old generation, now he is the luck to have two sons who are taking over, but... Uh, but uh, <laughs> but um, I think that's the most important to say. Another way to explain who is behind um, the car racing, when you speak about me or other famous drivers like Mario or Jackie Stewart, I'm sorry yeah, for your... <laughs> yeah, we'll catch up. <laughs> but... Um, you are so important, all of you, in that um, in that sort of life. And I should add also the spectators. If the show is good, if the spectators are there, you can uh, you have room for organizer, you have a uh, room for uh, for motor racing. And what I'm trying to say, it's valid in every aspect of uh, the life. But we are together. And of course, today we share our passion for motorsport. Um, so, yes, the book is important. I'm not necessarily making a promotion on the book. Because yesterday I met um, Mario. And I say, well, the first thing we say, we are survivors. We were lucky to survive from that uh, era. When I meet Mario or I meet Jackie Stewart, we say, we are alive. It's a miracle because we really race a lot in extreme condition. I'm not taking advantage to the fact that there were no safety. We were free to accept what we love to do. And we knew everything may happen. And I think, it, in a way, it's a freedom. Whatever, if you take uh, Alex Arnold, who is climbing uh, El Capitan, for example, without any safety, who is the champion of the extreme for those who are climbing, doing it without, without uh, uh, rope, without any helmet, without anything, this uh, thousand meter of uh, El Capitan, it does it. So I don't take the uh, advantage of saying, well, I'm brave or whatever. It's maybe risky, but I, it's a free choice. So that's important to say. So about Mario, I told him, I just realized that this gentleman that I didn't know before, told me he made the list of races and there are, I don't know, 578 races in it, including motorcycle. And Mario told me uh, I did 920. <laughs> <laughs> so so it's, everything, is everything is relative in, in, in a way. But um, on all that story, now we will start. I think the most important, it's not what you have done, it's the people you have met. Well, actually, because clearly at a certain age, uh, the, checkered, the checkered flag, it's not that far away. You can see it. Uh, you say, well, 
You have to use the time correctly, and a number of things has to be said. You, the human aspect in motor racing, clearly it's, um, for me, the most interesting uh, part, in a way. After we speak of the Dakar and all these things, because also there are options where you can um, have another vision of the world and also uh, a, a vision where it's much larger and it's not only concentrate on uh, on one subject. Well, um, that has been said. Maybe yeah. we can start. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Going going back. <laughs> <laughs> um, going going back a long yeah. way as a young lad. Your father was quite Hello. supportive, and here you are meeting Fangio. What were you thinking of at, at that point? Well, um, honestly, I didn't expect to have explained you uh, the private part of my life, but there are always some friends, so I'm ready uh, to put uh, the picture on the table. So, um, alors, on, that's my first racing car. On the on the left, uh, it has also two pedals like today. Um, but you are, yes, you have to pedal. I am afraid, huh? but uh, that's the way. Anyhow, on the right you have in the center Juan Manuel Fangio, winning the uh, 1953 Grand Prix at Spa, and then you have a. A small kid up there with some flower and with a very funny uh, hat, you know? Yeah, it's very funny. It's me. <laughs> I was taken there by uh, my father. I thought it was very boring, the Grand Prix. And I asked him not to take me back uh, in the future to any kind of motor racing. Because you have to know, I never dreamed about motor racing. I wanted, when I was grown up, to become a gardener, a gardener or a gamekeeper. So it's really far away from motor racing. Um, sorry. But, but then you didn't well, go on. It's not finished yet. Oh. I have to explain. <laughs> You I, still have a half a no. I am, I'm on the American page. <laughs> no, I say, I, I say that because what took, you in, in, took me in motor racing, it's uh, the fact that I was not very good at school. But I was already fairly clever in a way because I always promised my parents to do better that I was never planned to do, but... I promise it, so uh, you can see I'm really a thief. They gave me to make me more happy about school and to encourage me to do well and to go to university and all these optimist, optimist things because the parents care for uh, their children, uh, for their future. They gave me a motorcycle and for the very... No, you can put the, the motor. Um, they gave me a motorcycle, and rather than being on the last bench near the window, in the winter near the radiator, not disturbing uh, many people, so I was okay with my teacher. They gave me a motorcycle, and rather than being last, I discovered that I could be relatively good. So, um, my parents were very happy to find that uh, I had a passion for something, and I was doing relatively well. Later, they, pay, they had a hard time about that choice, but anyhow. Um, this is trial. I don't know if it exists in the uh, in United States, but in Europe, there is a competition which, uh, which shows you the ability to go in very special sections without putting any feet down and then um, and um, you have one picture or more picture on motorcycle only one okay it's okay no 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 it's okay okay 
Uh, I say that because also during my career, it's clear that on uh, wet conditions, I was clearly quite good. And also my opponents were feeling that uh, I was doing well. And the reason is it's because I did motorcycle before. You have to have the balance. You have to be a, a soft touch for the grip. Um, you have to read the, the surface, more water, less water, the slippery side and everything. But uh, the reason I was doing well on wet conditions, clearly it's a motorcycle. In that aspect, I did also uh, enduro and the kind of motocross. And uh, that will help me later to do off-road racing in the desert because you learn how to, um, how to read the surface and you can predict what's coming and so on. Okay. <laughs> and you quickly moved into sports cars and Formula One with owners like... Ah, yes. Uh, on the left side, you have uh, John Ware, um, the... Um, the uh, the head of uh, the John Wire team, that's opened a, a door. We have also a Cantirel somewhere. Okay, well, anyhow, that gives me the idea to speak about Bernie and uh, Karl Haas. They were talented as a, as a team, Karl and Bernie, because they were really a team, these two. I don't know if you know them. You know Karl Haas and Bernie? Yeah. Okay, because he chose me to drive the Canam in 79, and we had a fantastic season. But more than that, I love it so much, their human aspect on motor racing. It was really like Ken Tyrrell that we are going to see later, if I understood. They are just outstanding. They were, uh, you, you were in the team, a family member. You could be the son, he could be the father, he could be uh, the coach, he could be, could be everything. And um, I like to mention them because um, they were humanly fantastic. And probably the second part, it's probably, probably even more interesting that the incredible goals they have, uh, they have done together. So uh, now we have John Wire. At John Wire, there is another, uh, the man in charge of the races where David York, same comment for him as humanly. Um, 67, the Mirage, which uh, was originally a GT40, modified, who is a better uh, sleeve streaming, um, a coefficient of penetration in the air better to go back in uh, 68 to, uh, to Le Mans. Um, the number six, the, the car, it's an iconic car that I don't have to explain to you that um, it remains in motor racing one uh, of the iconic car and that makes you think about that era where you had um, Carol Shelby. Um, Roger Penske, Jim Hall, and many others. That car is iconic because um, what is interesting in tracing is when you you don't you have no idea who is going to win it until the last minute. Um, at the finish, they were only under twenty meter between uh, Ocar and the Porsche. The originality was um, to start last and to finish first. Uh, it happens sometimes. It's not a dream. It may work, definitely. I start last because regarding um, the safety, it's clear that running to your car, jumping in your car, starting the engine, go to the straight at Le Mans, at 330 kilometers per hour at the time, and put your seat belt, your six-point six seat belt on, I guarantee you, you have to be a magician to be able to do it. 
And obviously, I was not a magician, but some other were, maybe. But uh, it means everyone started in those days without a uh, seatbelt. And people think I was an inspiration for the change of the Le Mans uh, start. But the reality, the man who changed the Le Mans start killed himself on lap one at Le Mans. And he went off, no seat belt, lost his life. This gentleman is called uh, John Wolf, and uh, he's the man who changed the rule for Le Mans. I was only a small step on that. Uh, the story, the end of the story. I know you are in a hurry, but <laughs> I've not finished yet because I. Um, the story is uh, for the last three years we fight with the Porsche. The incredible that we had to change your, your racers at, uh, at the same time, refuel at the same time, and we could not leave each other for the last three hours. And that was covered for the first time by a, a Breguet Atlantico. It's an airplane, life. So for the last three hours, nobody knew who was going to win. Anyhow, um, to beat the gentleman who is called Hans Hermann, who is, was a real talented and expert Formula One driver and uh, another, another survivor in a way, I have to use a, a, a trick that usually you don't use in motor racing anyhow. We realized that 20 seconds before four o'clock, uh, we had to do an extra lap. And unfortunately, I show him the previous lap, what I was going to do to try to beat him. So, and to beat him, it was absolutely uh, important that I could take his, his sleep, sleep streaming down the straight. It was vital because his car was faster than mine. So as I show him that I was planning to do, I had to find something else. So I remember that when I was younger, when I was dating a, a young girl, I had some problem with the engine sometimes, and uh, I stopped for a while, you know, uh, on the side of the route to find all sorts of excuses. <laughs> so that's what I did the last lap. I slowed down more and more and more, and at the end, he thought I was running out of fuel. And then he went, and then I went too in his sleep streaming, and then I beat him at the end. So you see, in normal life, you can also learn a number of things that can be used in motor racing. <laughs> so. Here's Ken Tyrrell. Ken Tyrrell, equal to uh, Carl, and Carl Haas and, uh, and Bernie. It took me when, uh, ah, you have to know something. I had my driving license driving tanks. And uh, I practiced I practice my, uh, because there was a military service in those days. So when I was uh, still very young, I had to do my service. So I used to, uh, the Caterpillar were um, steel in steel, so you could slide on uh, a 47 uh, tons tanks uh, around the buildings, making a lot of sparks. And even you can park backwards. So you block a, a caterpillar and then you spin and then you let the, you let the go and then you park. And as I was an instructor in the end, everyone, everyone was able to do some spins with, uh, with tanks, French tanks. Um, it took me in the early days, he believed in me. Um, before going to the army, he was there afterwards, and he really is the man who gave me my chance to, uh, to grow up in motor racing. Because motor racing in those days, it, it was like having classes. You have to go step by step uh, to the next one, and there was always someone to offer me a, a car. About safety, in the early days when I, driving, I was driving saloon car racing, I was wearing uh, 
a Fred Perry uh, tennis shirt. <laughs> I give you that detail because it's the equal of uh, it's the equal of a Ralph a Ralph Lauren sh uh, shirt, and everyone was racing like that. And um, the overall uh, was supposed to be fireproof, but when it was washed one time, it was finished. And honestly, it was made out of cotton. And uh, to have that or nothing, uh, it's like having ballet shoes and all these. Uh, <laughs> that, that's it, and that's it. Anyhow, um, so Kentirel offered me to drive Formula 2. And then um, one time in 67, I did the third fastest at the Nürburgring uh, into the Formula One grid. And the Nürburgring is 23 kilometer long, 160 whatever uh, corners. And, um, but I must admit when I was a little bit younger even, I did a competition who was the 86 horse of the Nürburgring. Two drivers, regularity. So, even if you're not really clever, at the end, I guarantee you, you know where the track goes. And you know every detail of it. So I use it later. And that race with not that car, another one, because that I was trying uh, some more camber on, uh, on the car and it didn't work. <laughs> um, and that was, that was before and that was after. <laughs> Go. You drove for Lotus for a while too. What was what was Chapman like, and uh, the preparation of their cars is always talked about. Well, I will not answer to that now, but <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, the result of the Nurburgring was. Jackie Stewart was negotiating his contract to, to contract to go to Ferrari in 68. And um, in the negotiation, the story says that uh, he was discussing with a commandator, a commandator, and the commandator says to his secretary, what does he want this Inglese? What does he want? Is English uh, la mia fabrica? He wants my uh, my uh, manufacture of cars, and that was the end of the negotiation. So, thank you, thanks to Jackie, they came to me, and they asked me to uh, drive for Ferrari, where I spent five years, and we had success in every aspect. Uh, prototype with Mario, for example, who was my teammate, or successes with um, Derek Bell, who was a super, another nice human person. So we had a lot of friendship. We matched well. We didn't have to argue on, on anything. We had the same philosophy, and then we won the four times uh, Le Mans. Anyhow. Uh, motor racing is made with uh, some up and down, <laughs> and uh, sometimes the right choice and sometimes not. So I left Ferrari in 73 because I had a number of technical problems, and I went to, um, to Lotus. I was very successful and competitive, but unfortunately, when I arrived, it became more complicated on budget because motor racing was expensive. You see the appearance. The nice thing about uh, motor racing before the 70s, you were mercenary in a way, supposed to be professional, but we were professional mercenary. We could race where we want. For example, uh, I was able to, to race for Ford Motor in long distance, and Ferrari in Formula One. This type of ID cannot exist today. Plus the fact that today you have also the exclusivity of a sponsor. So drivers today can only do one thing at the time. And that's the difference with the time 
I belong to, that's the time of the dinosaur. Dinosaurs were able to do off-road racing, uh, long distance, Formula One, Formula Two, uh, saloon car racing without any problem. So that type of, that sort, that race of driver will never exist anymore. And that's how Jackie or Mario or race midget car, uh, NASCAR, Indy, Formula One, Le Mans, and all these things will not exist anymore. You will have real professional in the, in the future. And you see, it, we are quite relaxed. I think on one side, you have Clay Regazzoni who had that terrible accident in Long Beach at the end of the street where he lost uh, his legs. His legs, me and um, a young Italian Ferrari driver called Ign Ignacio Giunti, who lost his life in Argentina. Go. Ah, that uh, we are concerned today because the, mo the motivation of this, this morning was to explain you uh, the progress of safety and the important role played by a uh, few companies and few pioneers like uh, Eve. Um, the only thing there was at that 1970, there were few guardrails. Um, at the time, few catch fencing to stop uh, the car, a little bit of gravel and nothing else. Uh, in this picture, uh, you see that uh, you have to be lucky sometimes. So um, I was hit by uh, I was hit by um, Jackie Oliver, who was my teammate at Le Mans. He took me uh, on an angle of 90 degrees. I was, uh, there was two, 210 liters of fuel in the car, so the chassis was damaged. I was trapped in it. Uh, um, I didn't stay long, but maybe 12 or 14 seconds uh, into it. But I had already an equipment, uh, a fireproof equipment. But you see, uh, still, uh, the result, it's the helmet. It can show you, uh, uh, after that, you can go to church and uh, uh, thanks the Lord for uh, almost every Sunday if you go to church, because um, it was really a miracle. Also, I fall in the fuel, so uh, I was burned at the hands and the legs and so on. So. Uh, that's why I say at the end, if you are a survivor, it's really nice. Huh? <laughs> Thank you. Here. Thank you, uh, Eve, for doing. Hello, Eve has most, uh, most of my life given me the uh, overalls. I must admit, uh, I was bell on the helmets because he made also some helmets, but I think the fidelity is very important. Uh, when you're concerned in motor racing and uh, uh, money is not the main goal, really. There is many other aspects that are really important. Hello. Uh, here, here are three survivors. And yes, I mean, uh, one of the very, you're right. There are, on, there are few, uh, Brian, who lives in the United States. It's fantastic. David Ops on the extreme. Uh, is the one who was commenting on TV and who has a big sense of humor. And the two are when they have a little glass of uh, white wine or right wine, they are very funny. <laughs> they, are really very, they are really very funny. And uh, well, I'm amazed I'm smiling, I'm smiling there. You're yeah, smiling. well, and that's in Monza. Uh, Monza probably 67 or 68 with either with the Ford Mirage or with the GT40. Okay. Uh, I love that. First of all, you have in the middle, well, the chance you have when you, I live a, a long time on any, from the 1960s and, and until, of course, no, you meet people who are incredible. Paul Newman, definitely outstanding. 
I would have loved to have Steve McQueen in it because also they are the people who were passionate like you are by motor racing and they were, do they were doing well. They were really real contenders. So uh, Carl Haas that I loved so much, he always smoked that incredible uh, huge, uh, the word is correct, huh? a huge cigar. cigar. Okay. Um, <laughs> Most of the time he was chewing them uh, more than smoking them. But the, he had, a, before the start, before the start, he was always making a sort of prior around and... Okay. <laughs> I love the car. But to me, the Lola I drove uh, in the Canam is the, is the car with the highest level of motor race, racing aspect, plus the V8, plus the noise. Noise is part of the music and uh, of motor racing. I think uh, later this morning you are going to speak about the electrical cars and all these things and safety in electrical cars. It's not really the same type of, uh, of uh, music. So I love the car. I love these two uh, men. And um, I'm touched to see Carl like that because it's a long time uh, and it reminds me um, the good days. Yes. Yes, because you have to know in motor racing, there are a lot of happiness, but also there are a lot of sadness. And um, you have wounds you never recover of, but you live, you live with it. Like uh, enfin, we all know that in life. Uh, we have some losses sometimes you never you never recover you raced in iraq and the and ovals which weren't your favorite but i looked through here many of these are nascar drivers who are survivors today daryl waltrip and several others richard petty is still around so maybe the closed car turned out to be safer for them even with the high speeds? Uh, <laughs> uh, my first reaction is to say, uh, when I see the IROC, is to say it was an experience. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. In 69, everybody believed really I could be world champion, and, 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 and I met Bill France. Senior. So after the 24th of Daytona, I say, well, would you like to try a, a NASCAR car and to do the 500 of Daytona? So as I was totally innocent, I say, why not? <laughs> and I think he was innocent too, in a way, because he didn't know the story afterwards. Anyhow. It was nice, it was really nice to uh, ask Junior Johnson, I'm sure he was at the time clearly the man of the NASCAR and having uh, the best possible car. So uh, the Monday after the 24th, I was on the track and uh, they say, go carefully and learn, okay. And honestly, it's difficult to drive a car like this. It was difficult at the time, and at that time, it was probably even more difficult for me, not for the others. But um, the morning was nice, and say, okay, now you're okay, you're well seated, you know where the pedals are, you can shift it well, and okay. I, f I felt it was really loose after driving the GT40, entering in the banking uh, flat out and everything. So with that Junior Johnson car, uh, I really had to think about what I was going to do. And, you know, it was reasonably okay to say. So in the afternoon, they say, now you can go. So I go. I did three laps. I crashed in the wall. I lost. First, I saw the front fender going in, and then the, do the door went out, and the car was redu <laughs> reducing progressively. And at the end, there was only half a car in the direction the rest was missing. <laughs> that was the end of my career in NASCAR. So 
15 years later, Les Richter. Uh, who knows Les Richter? Pa, 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 Les Richter. California guy. Riverside. What a lovely person. I love it very much. And you know, we race, uh, I was racing that uh, with John Fo uh, George Fulmer, who was preparing the car for me and giving all the indication. I thought 15 years, that maybe I will understand how it works. But unfortunately, I still did not understand how it works. And so I was permanent, permanently last. So please take that picture out. <laughs> But I'm glad to know everybody is alive. <laughs> and you're right. Yeah, you're right. The cars have improved so much. They were strong in those days. They are even better uh, today. And clearly, generally, in motor racing, uh, General uh, the, the race course, it's day and night racing. It's really day and night. You referred to this earlier at uh, Le Mans, where so the pictures are not in order. <laughs> no. I'm sorry. <laughs> but a man of yours. <laughs> but. So this is Chris Simon running. I don't know where, but he's running, but not in the direction of the car. <clears throat> and clearly, I go to the car. So maybe <laughs> the question is, where is he going? Maybe to the loo? <laughs> or a, a last minute, a last minute pit stop? I don't know. And on the other side, uh, it's me uh, crossing uh, the road. I must admit, it took too much time to join the other side. So at the end, I really uh, had to do a sort of movement like this and press the last two steps, because otherwise I would have been eaten by uh, a number of cars. So I ran a little bit. I didn't walk on the, the last part was uh, in urgency. Thank you. And your, your good friends here. Many people associate you with Porsche in, in those years. And, uh, yeah, I thought you were going to say it's a pity to spoil the champagne like that at uh, the finish. <laughs> yes, we look young, Derek, the famous Derek Bell. And um, that must be the 1982 win with the the Porsche made by that incredible engineer with Snowbird Singer. Um, yes, you're ready to sign. That makes me think, when you're young, you're ready to sign for one win at Le Mans. You will sign a contract. You win the one time, OK. What is fantastic, it's clear that it's to win six times and to be to win six times and to be in the right car in the, in the team. Because in the team, there is always one who doesn't work well, and another one who has never any kind of problem. Anyhow, that shows us, I'm sorry, that shows us that um, um, that you need to be extremely, uh, extremely lucky in a way. And in the destinies, your path, your path is directed by the people who give you the option to go um, uh, left or right, because that changed the trajectory. Um, that make me sing and make me sing about the people who prepare the car. For example, uh, in long distance, I think the guy who made that book discovered that we won, I'm sorry, I don't like to say I, but uh, uh, people like Derek and uh, Brian and uh, Mario and Jochen Maas, I share the steering. We won 40, 46 long distance races and more than 80 podium. Wow. So that's why also I always say that the mileage I have covered in we will miss the last one, but uh, uh, it's impressive to survive and to avoid all fatal accidents because even if 
as it was mentioned by uh, Yves, the security has changed drastically. But in motor racing, you have the speed and the fatality, which always, unfortunately, which always exist. But the basic idea is to do everything you can do to make a better car, a safer car, safer track, and safer equipment. I love the, you know, I'm a, I love, uh, I love the color blue and white. I have always blue and white, basically. That's to remind me that it's uh, <laughs> 10 o'clock. <laughs> One more. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, I love the shoes of uh, Eve there, or match my jacket, for example. Thank you, Eve, for making these shoes for me uh, today. <laughs> And they are also fireproof. Anyhow, hello. Uh, so in, in California, we're very familiar with off-road, with the Baja 500, Baja 1000, the sport people we know. Eve's a big fan of off-road. So we know a little bit about desert racing. But you have been there, and you've won. You've been many Paris de Cars. You've won. You've won the event. How many more minutes I have? As many as you want, sir. No, because I saw at 10 o'clock there is someone following me. Stay all day. He, he, he agrees. <laughs> you okay. agree? Okay. Yeah. He following you. <laughs> Thank you. So, Paris Dakar is the longest and, in my opinion, the hardest rally uh, in the world. On the sports side, it's incredible. You start the day, uh, the distance roughly, it's 10,000, 12,000 kilometers, sometimes 14,000 kilometers. And at the time, three weeks of racing with two days of rest. So very demanding for the, the machine. You start in the morning and for 800 kilometers, sometimes 700 kilometers, you go flat out in the middle of uh, nowhere. And um, it's an interesting experience because you cannot cheat with yourself. You're facing the reality of the desert roads and the emptiness of certain surface of the uh, African continent. And um, I love the idea that you just can't cheat and can't tell all sorts of excuses uh, if you're stuck in the sand and uh, you're facing uh, problems that you never known, you haven't known before and you never know how to solve them and you have to find your way. Plus the fact that um, you discover the interest is, one is the sport aspect, the second one is to discover Africa and people who don't live like uh, we live. Um, to leave the uh, solidarity who exists in those countries to survive. And also, you realize how small you are, whatever you have done on this planet. When you have the emptiness around you, the human aspect of the people who survive in the difficult, difficult conditions, or are the majority of people on this planet, Two-thirds of the planet doesn't live like us, and they face daily uh, survival uh, circumstances. So that was a positive, positive aspect for me, because uh, rather than being only focused on uh, motor racing and winning, winning, because the goal is winning, uh, to be one of the best, if possible, you have a vision on the world or goes to 180 degrees, and you can understand the difference, it's a huge difference. If you, are, if you have the possibility to see, to see the invisible and to pay attention to them, it changes your life. Enfin, now you know what I'm thinking about that, uh, that aspect. Anyhow, um, the other aspect is the incredible, you see the Porsche who exists, uh, that's a, a 959, that one, but you had the same version in 9-11, and you see 
the new uh, the new version 2500 piece of that Porsche has made of that era anyhow i tell you the story the right story for that when i came out of that car in 83 i went back to the factory at Porsche factory and i saw their rally car running on the test track and i thought that could be the car for Paris Dakar that could be the challenge to bring a sport car into an off-road uh, race. And um, what I didn't know at the time, uh, they were preparing their first four-wheel drive uh, transmission. Um, and that's the reason why they joined me. But as they were careful, I was entering the car, organize uh, the team, they made the car, we made the list of things we have to modify it, and with their engineer and with their mechanics, we did the first uh, 911, or was a winning car. We make a second attempt with that car, but the car was too new, that car was too new, too much electronic at the time, or were not, um, uh, or hasn't run, run before. There is an engine of uh, B-Turbo engine who was the first one also for Porsche in it. So year two, we missed it. And year three, they won again. That car was able to do uh, 230 kilometers per hour in the desert. And I must admit, I didn't do it personally. I stopped at 210. I think that was enough. <laughs> but uh, my teammate with the other car pushed flat out and did 200, uh, 230 uh, kilometers per hour. And to represent that iconic uh, era, uh, Porsche decided to make that um, um, limited series of uh, Paris Dakar. So, um, Your colors. Uh, not my color, that's Rotman's color. That's Rotman the cigarette. Yeah. That's the other amazing thing. Uh, I was sponsored often by cigarette company, but I never smoke. <laughs> often it stays. It has to stay between us, of course. <laughs> huh? <laughs> um, is the end? Oh, no. Uh, yeah, but we have seen that one. Uh, that's enough. We have seen that one already. So, and whatever memories you have of, of seeing seeing you race or reading about Jackie racing in the old days, to hear him live in this casual even though I was rushed a little bit by the uh, projector person, <laughs> to see him in this environment and see him up close, it's, it's just terrific. This is going to stick with you a long, long well, time. That you, the day you saw Jackie. Honestly, I tried to catch up with the time where motor racing, when you're young, it's about ego, individualism, and uh, there are qualities that I don't recommend to uh, anyone. But... Uh, you see, with the time running, it helps you to appreciate what the other do for you. And uh, today, the most important part, I've told you a few stories. The best one, I'm sorry, I keep for another time because uh, they are more, more they don't have to be known. No, I think maybe later. But um, <laughs> anyhow, uh, thank you for having join us. Uh, thank you to have shared uh, with Stan Vintin your interest for motor racing safety. Um, I think we are lucky that racing exists today and uh, without hurting anyone. Uh, maybe it happened one day, but uh, it's extraordinary compared to that era of the 70s where you had two or three Formula One drivers dying, uh, dying every year. Yeah. So, um, so uh, thank you. Thank you for being there. And uh, I love these moments with uh, what I call my friends. And uh, yes, we are together involved in that. Thank you. Thank you.